Welcome, everyone. This is Richard Eidlin with Business for America. Uh, thanks for joining our conversation today on what can American business learn from Israel's democratic crisis. We're excited to be <clears throat> partnering with J Street on this venture here today. Let me just quickly tell you all a little bit about Business for America and why we have partnered with J Street on this important webinar. Business for America is a national nonpartisan not-for-profit that works to educate and then engage American businesses on the threats and challenges that our democracy is facing. We work in Washington, D.C. and across the country on a variety of issues that we feel help strengthen our dem democracy. And that includes voting rights, election security, civic education. We spent a good bit of time um, working on the Electoral Count Reform Act. So we are also interested in how democracies around the globe are facing similar challenges um, as strongmen seek to undermine the rule of law. Authoritarian tendencies tend to grow, we're noticing. And polarization is a factor not only in the United States, which negatively impacts business and the economic climate, but also the same types of crises are happening in Israel and in other advanced industrial democracies. So with that, um, let me turn it over quickly to my colleague Adina from J Street, and she'll introduce herself, and then we'll begin with the formal program. Thanks so much, Richard. Uh, really a pleasure to be hosting this uh, very important webinar uh, together with you and with Business for America. Uh, my name is Adina vogel Ayalon, and I am J Street's Chief of Staff. Um, and just a little bit about J Street for those of you that uh, are not familiar with J Street. Uh, we are a pro-Israel, pro-peace, pro-democracy, American political advocacy organization. Uh, we work in the American political system, in the Jewish community, um, and with others who sh uh, share our core values. Uh, we advocate for diplomacy first, uh, American leadership and policies that advance justice, equality, peace, uh, and democracy in Israel, and of course, also in the wider region, as well as the United States. Uh, so pleasure to be here with all of you. Great. Thank you, Adina. <clears throat> and I, I wanted to also uh, thank two of our co-hosts uh, today, the Network for Responsible Public Policy and Just Laws uh, law firm, our friend Steve Masters in Philadelphia. Um, both organizations helped to get the word out about this. And um, so we're, we're appreciative of that. So let me introduce our, our first guest speaker, <clears throat> Ian Basson, uh, is a co-founder and uh, the CEO um, of Protect Democracy. And the reason we invited Protect Democracy to join us today is that they have been looking at this, um, the emergence of strongmen and authoritarian leaning uh, leaders in democratic societies across the globe. And we thought it would be valuable to set the stage by having Ian um, give us sort of the, the broader perspective of how similar tendencies and trends and phenomenon are occurring not only in the United States, not only in Israel, but also happening in countries like Brazil and Mexico, India, Turkey, etc. So um, as I said, Ian is the co-founder and executive director of Protect Democracy, which was formed in November of 2016. Prior to co-founding Protect Democracy, Ian was Associate White House Counsel in the Obama administration, working closely with administration officials on ensuring that they complied with various laws, rules, and norms that protect uh, democratic institutions and the nature of our government. Uh, Ian uh, is based in Washington, D.C., and Ian, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, thanks, Richard, and thanks, Adina and J Street, um, for having us on and for all you do on a regular basis. Uh, we are big fans and supporters. Um, so as Richard notes, uh, we formed this organization at the end of 2016 out of a recognition that something was beginning to happen here in the United States that had been happening all over the world, which was a turn away from what 
we all collectively right, refer to as liberal democracy. And uh, I don't use that term liberal in the way that I think American political reporters refer to it to mean people on the left. I mean it in the more traditional political science sense of John Stuart Mill and, and John Locke laying out a vision of government that is both democratic uh, in that popular majorities select representatives, but liberal in that it has other institutions that, that check majority rule, checks and balances, the rule of law, the protection of individual rights, the combination of majority rule and those institutions of checks and balances, rule of law, separation of powers, make up what we might think of as liberal democracy. And we are living in a moment um, where large swaths of the globe are beginning to move away from liberal democracy. Um, and importantly, at least in the United States, and this has largely been true for most of Israel's existence as well, both those considered on the political left and those considered on the political right supported liberal democracy. Um, for most of the 20th century, uh, conservative liberal democracy uh, was the Republican Party and progressive liberal democracy was the Democratic Party, but everybody agreed on liberal democracy. Um, and we're living in a moment in which that is no longer fundamentally the case. Um, so let me give a little bit of historical perspective on this. Um, the, in the modern era, liberal democracy as a form of government has risen and fallen in a series of waves. So the political, the, the political science scholarship on this shows that in the late 18th century, you really had the sort of modern advent of liberal democracy as a form of government. Um, really, you had gone several thousand years since the Greek and Roman times without having the idea of democracy in any form, sort of self-rule in any form, uh, really taking hold in any country in the world. And then, of course, with both the U.S. and French revolutions, you get this idea of popular sovereignty. Um, and just coming out of the Enlightenment, you get these ideas of liberalism as well and these institutions. And so in the late 18th century, imperfect though it was, you start to see governments uh, take on liberal democratic forms of government. And then they start to fade away. We all know what happened after the French Revolution, right? Um, and then again, the second wave rises after World War II, um, as the sort of European empires begin to recede and countries that had formerly been colonized throw off the yokes of colonialism. Many of them become democratic to begin with. 1960, the year of Africa, you get all these independence movements and initially they become democratic. And then that second wave recedes as well as many of those countries fall into authoritarianism and dictatorship. And then 19, mid 1970s, the dictatorships are overthrown in Spain and Portugal and the third wave of democracy is launched. And this is the biggest one yet. In the last quarter of the 20th century, democracy spreads to its furthest reaches ever around the globe and improves in quality in the countries that it is in. And you see this pretty much upward trajectory of the third wave throughout the last quarter of the 20th century. And then sometime around the early aughts, that wave peaks as well and starts to go into reverse. And we are now living in the recession of that third wave of democracy. And what is rising in the place of liberal democratic forms of government are what the Harvard scholar Steve Levitsky has dubbed um, competitive autocracies. Um, and Levitsky and his co-author Luke and Wei use this term to describe a form of government that you are starting to see proliferate in the 21st century that is different than what alternatives to democracy look like in the 20th century. So in the 20th century, when democracy was overthrown, typically you just had a one party dictatorship takeover. So you think about 1930 Germany, the enabling act simply abolishes democracy, right? And creates this sort of one party dictatorship. Um, that's not what's happening in the 21st century. In the 21st century, what you're getting is you're getting elected leaders who come to power normally through legitimate elections and then maintain the veneer of democracy. They maintain multiple parties, they maintain legislatures, courts, the appearance of separation of powers and checks and balances, they hold regular elections, but they pull the threads out from behind those things so that they are almost you know, sort of Potemkin in nature. There's nothing really behind them. And so over time, as has happened in places like Hungary or Venezuela, or in extreme cases, Russia, sure, there's an election, but nobody has any doubt who's going to win the Russian election, who's going to win the Venezuelan election, right? Not because the winner wins it fair and square on a free, even playing field, but because they've essentially rigged in advance, right? Um, and that's what you're starting to see rise as democracies recede in the 21st century. And what do these competitive authoritarian movements do 
when they come to power. Um, we asked this question of a swath of political scientists in January 2017, um, and they all basically said that there is a consistent playbook across the world from Hungary to Turkey to Venezuela that you see playing out when these authoritarian, uh, these competitive authoritarian movements rise and come to power. They all do essentially the same seven things, and they do it whether the person leading it is deliberate and strategic and Machiavellian, the way that a Vladimir Putin or a Viktor Orban is. Um, and they also do it whether the leader, if the leader is sort of bumbling and kind of accidental and instinctive, the way that a Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela or Donald Trump in the United States might do it. They, because they all fundamentally believe that they are the only legitimate source of power uh, and that any uh, they represent the Volk. Uh, and any check on that power is illegitimate. And so you see them do seven things. First, you see them politicize independent institutions like law enforcement, the civil service, the military. Second, you see them spread disinformation from the government. Third, you see them aggrandize executive power and undercut the power of checking institutions like courts or legislatures or the free press or the private sector, importantly for this audience to know. Fourth, you see them quash dissent. Um, and in different ways than I think we probably all studied in school. Um, typically, it's not the banning of books, although we are now seeing that in the United States. But what Viktor Orban did in Hungary was he used the regulatory state to harass media outlets uh, whose coverage he didn't like. Um, he would audit them. He would impose regulations on them. He would prohibit the government from advertising with them. And he would make it so they couldn't compete fairly in the marketplace until they changed their editorial line. Um, fifth, they delegitimize vulnerable populations. This has been the tyrant's favorite tool since antiquity. If you can pick on a scapegoat and make people fight with each other over, the, over race or religion or sexual orientation uh, or national origin, they won't notice when you pick their pockets of money or power. Six, they corrupt elections. And seven, um, they incite violence. We have seen all those things play out in pretty much every country that's experiencing this rise of competitive authoritarianism and decline of liberal democracy. We are seeing it in the United States, and we're certainly seeing aspects of it right now in Israel. And I know my fellow panelists will talk about that. I had that very front of mind when I talked about aggrandizing executive power and undercutting checking institutions like the courts. Textbook example happening in Israel right now. So really looking forward to hearing from my fellow panelists uh, and talking more about this, because I think it's really important right now the competitive authoritarian movements are sharing ideas. They are meeting and swapping strategies. And those who still believe in protecting liberal democracy as, as Churchill said, the worst form of government except for all of the others and essential to maintaining open markets and robust growth, um, we need to be trading ideas as well about how we protect ourselves against this. So I'm really grateful to be on with all of you. Um, thank you, Richard, for hosting, and Adina, I'll talk to you. Yeah, <clears throat> Ian, thank you for that uh, very helpful summary. Let me ask just one quick follow-up question, which is, is there um, a similar response you find from the business community in these various countries that are experiencing the uh, competitive authoritarian uh, approach? Well, one thing uh, I will note, um, and this is a controversial scholar, and I know there's a lot of controversial views about him, but he does, the, uh, Samuel Huntington, the late, oh, you can't see it there because of my, there we go, the third mm -hmm. one. Samuel Huntington, the late Harvard scholar, wrote a book about the rise of each of the waves and the fall of each of the waves um, and tried to draw some conclusions about what made democracy rise when it was rising and what made it fall when it was falling. And there's a number of very interesting conclusions in the book, but one of them was that whichever way the private business sector went tended to be determinative. Mm -hmm. That either the private sector could be a bulwark against authoritarianism because it is a uniquely trusted independent institution that is at arm's length from the politics that goes on in government uh, and had the power and had enough you know, sort of weight and institutional capital to resist that movement. And because as many reports have shown, more open societies tend to be better um, for growth and business had an interest in standing up for it. That tended to both protect democracy and help it strengthen and grow. But when the private sector um, fell down or got captured, um, they became the handmaiden of authoritarianism's rise. And I'll give one example of this. So in Egypt, um, Hosni Mubarak maintained a dictatorship for 30 years because he understood that if he could make it 
so that success in the marketplace depended upon loyalty to his regime, he could create a symbiotic relationship with a few oligarchs where he kept their bread buttered and they kept him in power. And if you wanted to start a business or maintain a business and you were not playing that game with him, you were out of luck uh, in the marketplace. And the problem with that over time, as, as the oligarchs in Russia have found, is they basically simply become vassals. Of mm -hmm. the, um, and that's, you know, if you, if, if you like running a company, that's not a situation you ever want to be in. Ask Bob Iger right now, who thankfully is standing up and says, I don't want to be forced to make decisions about sort of political loyalty in order to run a fair business in the marketplace. And I think one of the challenges that will face C-suites over the next couple of years is, and this has happened and, and you know, this happened to Disney, it's, it's going to happen to others. Uh, the instinct will, I think, be, I don't want to be in Disney's fight. That's not helpful to my mm -hmm. company right now. I don't want to engage in a battle like that that is going to split my employees. It's going to split my shareholders. It's going to split all my stakeholders. I don't need that headache. The problem is that headache is coming for you at one point or another, whether you want it to or not. Um, and as with a wildfire, the time to stamp it out is in the beginning um, when it's just a brush fire, not when it has gotten stronger. And so it requires, and this is obviously the, the you know, what CC is going to do generally, it requires a bit more long-term thinking than short-term thinking, because the short-term thing is going to be like, keep my head down. I don't want to become a punching bag. I don't want to divide my stakeholders. But in the long term, this is going to put you under a thumb, and it's much easier to get out ahead of, and it's much easier to get out ahead of as a critical group and a critical mass. One company standing up is really, really difficult, and you become an easy punching bag for those leaders who are who are trying to sort of, you know, change the way that our, our government operates with respect to the private sector. This is why it's really important for business associations like Richard's. Uh, like the chamber, like the business roundtable. And I will point out Richards is doing a really good job on this. And those other two that I mentioned are not. Um, but those organizations to come together and essentially create kind of like a NATO Article 5 pact that an attack on, uh, you know, an autocratic attack on one business is an attack on all. And I think, again, here, Israel creates a great model for us. The private sector did a phenomenal job standing up against the recent attempt to, to take over the courts. Um, and it was effective um, and they were able to stand strong. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about that too. Great, good. Ian, thank you. Um, so let's shift to um, get a, an insider's perspective on what's happening in Israel. And I think um, Adina and Orni will be able to tease out a number of the points that Ian just articulated. So Adina, I'll turn it over to you, thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, and thank you, Ian, for that excellent presentation. I think, um, as you said, it is very clear that we are seeing several of the actions, several of those seven actions that you outlined for us taking place currently um, in Israel with the election of this new government. So um, just to, to set the table with a little bit of, a, of background before I introduced Orni um, and dive into that conversation. So we saw the Netanyahu government um, elected at the end of last year. This is the most far, far right government that we have seen in Israel's history. Um, and it was very clear that they um, had a problematic agenda. Very quickly, um, they uh, proposed their package of what they called a judicial reform. And, you know, that's, you know, very clearly that action of under cutting power of institutions like the courts that are, um, you know, checks and provide checks and balances on executive power. Um, there were several components of this judicial reform package, which we other we and others call or a judicial overhaul or a judicial coup. Um, and I won't outline each of them, but it was very clear that they were targeting um, both the, the courts, the judges, and the, specifically the Supreme Court um, to try and essentially curb their power and ability to provide any sort of check on, on the executive branch um, and legislative branch of uh, branches of government. Um, and so what we saw um, was an incredible uh, mobilization of the Israeli public, hundreds of thousands of Israelis taking to the streets um, at the outset. And those demonstrations grew and grew um, week after week. Uh, and most notably, as mentioned, was the 
uh, participation of the private sector of the business community. Um, in the beginning, the you know business sector started to announce some sort of hesitant declarations about the possibility of damage to the economy um, with this uh, judicial reform package that Netanyahu and uh, the Justice Minister uh, Yariv Levine laid out. Um, but that uh, grew and became even more significant in terms of declarations um, and protests uh, of dozens of businesses throughout the country. Um, these protests also, of course, included also military figure reservists, people saying that they weren't going to stand up um, for reserve duty uh, as the democratic foundations of, uh, of Israel were being undercut um, by these proposals. Uh, and in late March, with this, you know, incredible um, public opposition, uh, the Prime Minister Netanyahu paused the legislation and uh, said that he would move forward for negotiations between um, the coalition and the opposition uh, to see if they could reach a compromise. Um, we are still right now currently in a moment in which um, we have not yet reached a compromise, but there are reports about those negotiations leading towards a compromise. We continue to see even just um, this past weekend, again, hundreds of thousands of Israelis continuing to protest um, and the the statements and actions also of the business community, you know, are are still front and center. Uh, and I I want to give Orni the opportunity to tell us a little bit more about uh, the business community's role. Um, just and one other important thing for me to note is that um, while it is clear that this uh, these judicial like reform plans are very targeted at the democratic fabric of Israeli society within the Green Line, it is very clear that they are also coupled with an agenda, a policy agenda that heavily impacts the reality on the ground over the Green Line, uh, the further entrenchment of occupation, also leading towards annexation. Um, so while this has an impact on the economy, on the fabric of society within Israel, there is a very clear impact that these actions will take and these actions could have or to continue to further the situation, the very problematic situation that we are seeing um, on the West Bank over the Green Line. So um, I will, um, we are very lucky to have Orni Petrushka here with us today. Orni is a technology and social entrepreneur. He has started a number of successful high-tech startups. Um, and in recent years, he's been working on the intersection of liberal democracy, Jewish, Arab relations, and uh, philanthropy. He is the chairman of Mulad, the Center for Renewal of Israeli Democracy, the co-chair of the Abraham Initiatives, um, the founder and chairman of Roundup, um, and of course, notably involved uh, in the headquarters of the resistance against the judicial overhaul. Uh, so Orni, um, thank you so much for being here. My first question to you is if you can lay out for us why you have seen so many Israelis become politically engaged at this moment and mobilize to defend uh, the Supreme Court and democratic uh, principles and what does this movement see as the stakes um, of this current struggle? Um, well, th first, thank you, Adina, for the introduction, and thank you for hosting me here and uh, giving me the opportunity to share our experience in Israel. Uh, and thank you, Ian, for this excellent presentation. Actually, you you, you uh, saved me some some explanations here, so so this is very good. And um, so, you know, to the question, uh, I'd say that Israel's democracy is very fragile and the judicial overhaul or coup, whatever you want to call it, it hampers the independence of the Supreme Court and uh, removes, I'd say, the last check of the government's ability to do whatever it wants in Israel. Because Israel has no constitution, it has no two houses of parliament, we have only one, and actually the House of Parliament, the Knesset, is subordinate to the government. Uh, so, in practice, we have only two uh, two uh, branches of government, and there's not there's no federal system where where localities, municipalities can can have their own independent legislative authority. We're not part of any you know umbrella like the EU stuff like that 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 uh, will have some requirements. So you know, if it's passed, if this legislation, uh, the judicial overhaul is passed, the government could simply do whatever it wants, and uh, we will not have the courts to curb it. Uh, and Israel will transform to what Ian described before, uh, which I'll call it a hollow democracy. So that it has the the the, the outlines of democracy, 
but the substance will not be there. It's even sort of dictatorship because uh, again, if, if, if any future laws can be enacted and some of them can be laws that are uh, limiting the uh, electability of, spe of specific parties or specific sectors, then, then it makes it uh, very, very um, difficult or impossible to change the government. It will allow the government, which is made up of several religious parties, uh, to entrench religious norms in Israel's pu public life. And it, in addition, as Adina said before, it will allow the deepening of the occupation because part, some of the parties are uh, very uh, right wing. They want to diminish or nullify any prospects of future peace. So, and, and another aspect of that, or, or, or a byproduct, is also the rights of minorities, specific the Arab minority, which is 20% of Israel's population. Uh, the government is made up of, of the Haredi party, ultra-nationalist parties, the Likud party itself with some judicial zealots in it, uh, and it has Bibi uh, Netanyahu personal agenda to get away from his trial. So all those have uh, lined up, uh, for, you know, they, they all have the interest of uh, limiting or, or uh, removing the, the, the check of the Supreme Court. This is why the liberal Israeli public uh, has has uh, has risen, okay, and, and uh, it noticed and got alarmed by the prospect, and it went out to the streets, uh, and they came out to defend first and foremost to defend the, the the independence of the Supreme Court, but as the negotiations uh, started, the public had to give chance to them, those negotiations. It also took on some other agendas. That the government was pushing the resistance, I'll call it, it's not only protest, it's real resistance, uh, is broader now. It's not only against the, the, the judicial overhaul, but it has some other uh, objectives. And given that the government is already uh, trying to take extreme steps in, in, in favoring the religious parties uh, and its constituencies, the, uh, the resistance uh, really took on other, part, other issues like the budget and the recruitment law and things like that. Uh, the recruitment law is, 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 is uh, you know, is sort of new speech for 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 exempting the the religious part, the religious population from recruited to the military. And finally, we have to remember that uh, uh, there have been protests against Netanyahu for six years already, and something like that. So, so many of those who have already been out in the streets for some time. So people just view the stakes uh, as 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 high as could be. I mean, it's the future of Israel as liberal democracy. Uh, and I used the term liberal as Ian, def Ian defined it uh, previously, okay? as, as, as you know, in the traditional sense of liberal, not necessarily leftist or, or, or something like that. So these are the states. And this is, uh, this. Thanks, Arnie. Um, and so I, I want to talk now about specifically um, Israel's world-renowned and vibrant uh, high-tech sector. Um, can you tell us um, how you've seen Israeli tech companies and businesses engage um, in this uh, resistance movement? And uh, what do you think is so significant about their engagement at this specific time? Yeah, uh, okay. So first, let me just uh, spend a minute to describe the, the, the Israel business scene in a sense. And um, we have, uh, first of all, the, the, the uh, Israel society, I would say, uh, the businesses are uh, held at uh, high regard as, as no, uh, mo mo most societies, but more than that, uh, I'd say that the uh, uh, the high tech sector is very very dominant within the business sector. It's 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 uh, responsible for twenty five percent of Israel's GDP. Uh, so so it, it's naturally the most important sector in Israel's uh, economy. We have to remember also that the high tech sector. Is a sector that pays most of the taxes. It carried Israel's almost you know, miraculous success in the business sense and, and, and growth for you know to, to be included in leading countries in the world. And also the uh, the, the uh, this sector is naturally serves some of it graduates off the uh, military from from regular uh, uh, from mandatory service and getting some education there. 
Uh, so they hold pos uh, important positions in elite units in the military, in the military as reservists, uh, which is also very important in Israel society. Uh, and this blatant, overt, you know, anti-democratic steps that uh, have caused the, the, this uh, sector to, to, to rise up. And uh, it is the first time that the Israeli tech sector has risen and made a statement on issues that are not strictly related to the standing of the sector itself. Uh, and for me, it, is, it has been heartwarming because I, I, I've been uh, involved in these issues for some time and, and was not, uh, admittedly somewhat frustrated uh, from lack of involvement. The sector was not using its influence and its clout uh, in these issues for many years, but this time it is just erupted. And, and, and the, the business sector talk, took uh, it, you know, the, a leading role. And these days, entrepreneurs and investors and managers are speaking up. They, they, they are not only concerned citizens like the hundreds of thousands that are, that are with them on the streets, uh, but they're also deeply concerned about the future of Israel's economy uh, and, their, of course, the high-tech sectors. And as leaders of the tech sector, uh, they are afraid that allowing Israel to become a semi-theocratic state or semi-autocratic state with no judicial system will deny the certainty uh, and, and confidence and trust that investors need, and they will turn away from Israel. It will cause the collapse of the high-tech sector because if no investments, no, no, no venture capital uh, money comes in, then, then the tech sector will collapse. Uh, some are taking already, already precautionary steps, such as moving their company's finances abroad, uh, or even the entire company. So at least one or two companies have, have migrated or, already. And actually, I would say that the headquarters of the resistance is now using the vac vacate, vacated offices of such company. Okay? They, they donated their offices the, to, to, to the headquarters of the resistance. And new startup, startup companies, uh, and in Israel, this is all, all the time we have new startup companies, are being established abroad rather than definitely being registered abroad rather than in Israel. So um, as citizens, those uh, high-tech uh, executives, they participate, in, uh, they participate in the resistance. And as people with means, they also support it financially. Uh, they also have their own it's a brand of, of demonstrations, you know, because many professional groups have created their own, uh, their own protests. First and foremost, I would say the, 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 the legal uh, professions, because it's a legal overhaul, the judicial overhaul, have, have stepped up their own demonstrations, have established their own, and also the, the tech sector has had its own demonstrations because of the danger it sees to the entire uh, technology sector. I, I want to ask you one more question um, about how this uh, how this participation of the of the business sector of the private private sector um, is being both perceived by by the government is being discussed by this government and also are there any risks or backlash that they are facing either from the government specifically but also broad more broadly in the Israeli public. Well, first of all, everybody has noticed it, and 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 the government, of course, has has uh, seen it very clearly, like everybody else. But I would I, I would differentiate here between the uh, risks of the uh, of the tech sector and the risks of the entire business sector, and they say the more traditional part of the, of, of the business sector. The tech sector, as I, I would say, is pretty safe. It's independent. It's global in nature. The the investments usually come from abroad, the markets are abroad, uh, so, so the risks uh, are, are fairly minimal to the tech sector. It's, it's mobile, it could relocate, and the government would want to keep it in because of its immense contribution to the entire economy. Uh, so I don't think that the, the, there is a real danger from, gov from government's actions or any you know, retaliation against, uh, against uh, the, the protesting uh, high-tech sector. But traditional businesses are, are more vulnerable. Uh, and and uh, in fact, we are seeing some issues emerging vis-a-vis uh, -vis traditional sectors. For example, I would mention that 
there was a protest uh, a month ago uh, against the, the what, uh, what I described before, the recruitment law. And uh, one executive of one of the companies, a chairman of one of the companies, of of a, of a you know, of a large bakery company in, in Israel, probably the biggest bakery in Israel, was marching in this protest, and it was spotted, and the, and then the religious sector decided decided to boycott this particular bakery. What happened eventually is that uh, actually the the bakery benefited because. Other people bought more of the product, and in fact, the, the religious people who bought their product bought a subsidized product, and and and, and the, the bakery didn't make much money on. And so, so eventually, it wasn't that of a, of a, it wasn't an effective boycott, but but it was something that that was tried. Uh, and as was mentioned before, as Ian mentioned before, uh, the I think the traditional businesses can reduce the risk by acting together. By, by standing together, by 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 associating with each other. In, in general, I don't think the the, the, the there is a much danger, but uh, but but companies in the traditional sector need to be uh, need to be need to be cautious. Um, Orni, say a little bit more, if you would, about the tactics and the methods that companies have used. For instance. Has there been a coalition that's created of businesses for you know for Israeli democracy? Um, and I ask because you know here in the United States, the challenge is similar in that very few companies want to be out front on these types of issues. There's concern that they'll be targeted and there'll be economic repercussions, but they're willing to engage maybe quietly in meetings. Maybe they'll do, participate in a sign-on letter. So what what lessons might we learn from how Israeli businesses have come together uh, that could be relevant for U.S. companies? Okay, so so in, in I can say that the tech sector has come together. Uh, many companies, many, it's not the companies, it's the executives of the companies, it's the uh, investors, it's entrepreneurs, it's the managers. Uh, they've come together, they created their own group uh, of, as you said, high tech for, for democracy. Uh, and they are working together and they are uh, raising their own funds and they're orchestrating their own protests. And uh, sometimes, of course, together with the rest of the others, uh, they, there are more than 200 different groups. Mm. Uh, but I would say that the high tech group is probably one of the maybe five most important groups in, in the field. And they, and they are doing tremendous job working together, supporting each other, helping also, also other businesses that are more vulnerable. Because as I said before, the high-tech sector is less vulnerable than, than traditional businesses. So they can also help other businesses and, and uh, with, with, with advice, with, with, with support. So, so this has been working uh, quite well. And as I said before, uh, Richard, this is something that <clears throat> this phenomenon that you are describing from this from the US of of of, um, of, of some you no know, of not wanting to 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 participate in, in, in such overt uh, protests is something that we've experienced in Israel for many years as, as well. But I think that uh, because the Israel because the checks and balances in Israel are are are, are less less stringent and less le, 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 and just weaker than, than than in the US in the States, we've cr crossed the threshold and uh, quick you no know, more quickly and and that necessitated the uh, the businesses uh, to step up. And Orny, just a quick follow-up question. Uh, uh, someone has asked, has there been any collaboration between the business community and the labor community, labor unions? in the pro-democracy movement yeah okay so so we've been uh, the, the the labor union is is a very a fairly political animal here in israel uh, it's been dominated mostly by likud uh, with the, the, the reigning party uh, but still uh, at the height of the of the uh, of the protests and uh, when we had the biggest crisis in the, in late march the labor union, the Istadrut, the, the biggest labor union, has joined and actually called for a general strike and was part, uh, an important part, uh, of making the prime minister 
uh, pause the, the legislation and take it uh, and, and agree to, to start negotiations. Good. So let's, Orni, thank you so much. Um, we're going to come back to you here uh, at the end, but I wanted to move the conversation back to the United States and get a perspective from um, Jeff Shmulian, who is the um, founder and CEO and chairman of Emmis Corporation, the, and who's also worked across the globe and has had some very direct experience with authoritarian regimes and trying to do business, particularly in Hungary. Um, but to get Jeff's perspective on, you know, some of what you've been outlining, Orny, and then Jeff also to, you know, give us a sense of what American businesses might be able to do as we face, you know, increasing threats about voting access, um, increased polarization, um, attacks directly on companies uh, for the stands they're taking on different issues. So, so Jeff, thanks. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Richard. And this has been fascinating. I, I was thinking that I've seen all sides of this because we were look, at the very beginning of the Orban regime, nationalized in Hungary. Uh, the radio licenses, the two national networks were the first taken away. So we saw that. And and I've seen here a, a situation where the business community is usually reluctant to do much other than job open. Um, and especially I've seen the, the ma massive changes, especially in the in the nature of, of businesses' relationship with the Republican Party. Um, historically, chambers of commerce, uh, business have been very closely aligned to traditional Republican values, lower taxes, less regulation. That's certainly been the case where I've seen it in, in, in throughout the United States, especially in Indiana. Um, but then you've seen a shift. Um, we had a situation in Indiana where uh, the Religious Freedom Act uh, came about, which is really a thinly veiled attack on the gay community. Um, and it caused a firestorm. And the firestorm caused the loss of major conventions, um, major companies like Salesforce who said they will not uh, put a separate headquarters here. Um, and it cost the state a lot of money. It was during actually uh, Governor Pence's term. Um, and this is the first time that I saw the business community come together. There were a number of us who basically went to the governor and the legislature and said, this won't stand. And this, this was a big pocket bush book issue. I think a lot of people in the business community felt that the actual act was, was very, very questionable. Um, but I think it started as a pocketbook issue. And corporations came together and pushed back on the governor. And the governor and the legislature um, moved off of it. Um, I have found in the ensuing years that the corporate community um, is more and more engaged in, in the voting issues, social issues, um, for a number of reasons. One, hopefully because they think, you know, these are the right things. Two, because they realize that to attract a diverse workforce, um, they have to be uh, capable of, of creating a welcoming environment. Um, and that's especially true in places like Indiana, uh, which don't have, you know, some of the other benefits, you have to be able to attract a diverse workforce. And I think corporate leaders are finding out um, that as, leg as legislatures in red states um, become more and more conservative and more and more restrictive, the corporate community is, is forced to step out. Um, and that's why I think you've had success here uh, with BFA, Richard, is that the corporations mm -hmm. are saying, in the past, we may have been passive. Um, you know, if it didn't affect our bottom line, if it didn't, you know, we don't care. Now they care. And I think they care because they realize some of these things are very questionable uh, when it comes to restricting voting and when it, it mm -hmm. comes to, as you know, it, 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 it's only said, um, you know, marginalizing people. Um, I think the corporations are stepping up. Um, we have a different situation in Israel where, you know, it's really, you know, the uh, basically the, the far right and, uh, you know, and, and the tech se sector, this long, you know, religious significance, historical significance. Here, this is just the corporate community, um, which, which has finally said these things are hurting not only us as, as, you know, corporations, but us as a society and a society that's welcoming people and that is capable 
of attracting people to help our businesses. So I don't know whether it's altruistic or just economic, but I've seen a massive shift. It, it, now, the other side of this is um, that in red states, you now see legislators who in the past always listened to business leaders because they funded the campaigns and the Chamber of Commerce always you know, helped, helped them. They are now becoming largely indifferent to business leaders because they are, as you get into more authoritarian goals, uh, they find that uh, the notion of the traditional um, liberal, you know, democracy with, 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 with the business oriented side of liberal democracy is anathema to them. They, they are moving more toward this authoritarian street. And that means they don't really listen to traditional, you know, I want to say liberal conservative values uh, for liberal democracy. They they are tuned out because they're more focused on this new strain, which, as we know, has gained certainly prominence, you know, in, in, whether it's Hungary or it's Israel here in the United States. That's a major difference. Mm -hmm. I think I've rambled too long, but that gives you an idea. Yeah. Right. No, that that makes sense. And, and Jeff, if you think about the example that Orny gave us about the baker who experienced yeah. a boycott, and then you think about Disney, who has yeah. also experienced a boycott, yeah. And then you factor in that businesses are generally perceived by a wide range of stakeholders yeah. as being reliable, credible, representative, doing good for their communities. Um, you know, what is an appropriate response by business leaders when they do come under some kind of attack? Well, this is this is a new era. Um, you know, the 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 DeSantis attack on Disney, frankly. Um you know, I think this is something that, you know, you just haven't seen. Corporations have had DEI programs forever. They've been, they've invested in, you know, environmentally uh, friendly funds. Um, they've done all these things. DeSantis appears to be uh, an outlier. Uh, I, and I frankly, you know, can't quite understand how he picks a fight with the Walt Disney Company. You know, Bob Iger, you know, basically just threw the ball back over the court the other day and said, okay, we're just pulling a billion dollar, 2000 employee thing. I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I think you're going to see a lot of that. Um, even in, in, you know, in these anti-woke legislatures, uh, I just don't think that's a fight that any, you know, conservative legislature could win. And I'm not, I've seen mostly people saying to Sanis, what is he doing? So mm -hmm. I don't think you're going to see a lot of that, Richard. I really don't. Maybe I'm just too much of an okay. optimist. Okay. Mm -hmm. And or Orny, uh, you know, I welcome your comment on this, but also curious as to whether there was a particular business that uh, brought other companies into the conversation. You know, I think as Jeff pointed out, Disney here in the United States has woken up a lot of other companies who thought, well, you know, this is really not my fight. Um, but uh, how would you, what insight do you have, Orny, for us about, you know, leadership in Israel and maybe how that applies to leadership from the business community in the United States? Um, well, first, as I said before, I think that, uh, you know, the, the United States has a better immune system than Israel, uh, all in all. But once there is an action by a business, uh, it tends to uh, proliferate also to other businesses. Uh, they see the problem, they step up themselves. And I can tell you that in the high-tech sector in Israel, there have been some businesses that were uh, more, uh, say, further behind, was not, was not, were not willing to, to, to uh, step up on the first day. Uh, but as time evolved and they saw the gravity of the situation and they saw the other companies stepping up, they joined. Uh, so there was an open, one of the things that I think that, that uh, were, were special about the Israel resistance in general and the tech uh, aspect of it in particular was the diversity and the fact that it was open for everybody to, to join in at any time. Uh, there was no leadership, no official leadership at any point. Okay, and and even the headquarters that that, that was formed was was branded as an, a facilitator, an enabler, and not as a leader 
of the demonstration. It gave uh, just the, 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 the means to all other groups to participate. It gave the, 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 some legal support, it gave logistical support, it gave financial support, of course, uh, through, through a centralized uh, fundraising, it gave PR and, and, and media support. All that was done uh, from the headquarters, but it was done in a way that, 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 that enables the others and not leading them and not telling them what to do. Uh, right. Similarly, within the tech sector, that was one of those important groups, as I mentioned before, that, 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 that actually made use of, those, of, of the services of the headquarters, within this group was the same, the same mechanism. They, they, they helped each other uh, if, if anybody wanted to join, anybody wanted to have maybe a, not an extreme tone, but a more moderate tone. They could they could actually uh, express the, the, their views in, in an open manner, mm -hmm. uh, and and the, there were so many activities that everybody found a home uh, that was great. suitable for, for for their opinions. Great, great. Let let, let me just make a a, a quick um, plug for a effort we have underway at Business for America that actually Jeff is part of. And it's called um, Business Backlash Working Group. And we've brought companies together from a variety of different sectors to think through what are effective communication strategies. Uh, should your company find itself uh, under some kind of attack? <clears throat> and we think it's really important to have you know the wisdom of other companies' experiences. So any of you listening, if that is something you're interested in learning more about, be happy to share um, some insight about that. We have just a few minutes left, but Jeff, I wanted to turn back to you and see if, you know, you wanted to maybe comment on Ori's description of what's happening in Israel and, um, you know, what might be possible here in the United States. I mean, I think it's, I think it's heartening. I think, I think what happened with the government in Israel, um, created so much fervor. I think it's always a function of, you know, crossing over lines. And I think crossed over lines with the reform of the, of the courts. I think that was a line that the tech community was not willing to see crossed. And that spread over to the general parts of society. I think we saw that in the United States with, with, with decisions on abortion, with decisions on voting rights. Um, that at some point people have to stand up and say, this is important to me, whether it's the business community or the general public. And I think that's when, when you see the egregious behaviors of some of these autocratic characters, I think that's when people have to stand up and say no more. And, and as I tell my wife, I, be, I believe strongly there are more people who view them, democracy as sacred in this country and in Israel than I think there are people who don't. Uh, and that requires all of those people who believe it's sacred and believe that these values are something that are critical to fight for, to stand out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, Adina, uh, we'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Um, well, it's really a pleasure to be part of this conversation, um, and I, I want to invite um, everyone here who is not familiar with J Street um, to learn more about J Street. Um, also, we have a, a national conference coming up uh, from April 6th to 9th uh, in uh, April 2024, that is, uh, and uh, where we will be discussing um, a lot of the types of issues that we are talking about now, um, the role of the, the general public, also the role of businesses, both in as it relates to the struggles that we are seeing um, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and, and how we can leverage uh, these stakeholders to help move forward and advance a resolution to the conflict. Uh, we have been acting here in the United States um, very much in support of the protest movement and in support of all of those that have come out um, to bravely stand up against these uh, judicial overhaul. Uh, we've been urging the United States government to stand up for the shared values, specifically always noted is the shared value of democracy between the United States and Israel. And so we do feel um, that it is very much uh, the responsibility of the of Congress, of this administration to stand up and support all of those that um, are uh, actively fighting for the democratic fabric of uh, of Israeli society and uh, and to speak out against any action that threatens uh, the democratic foundations um, in Israel. And of course, uh, the 
that threatens a relationships is very much based upon that shared value of democracy. Um, so uh, thank I the links are in the chat uh, for more information about J Street and of course of our Congress, our conference. Apologies and uh, thank you so much, uh, Arnie, um, for for shedding some light on what's happening uh, in in Israel and of course Jeff uh, and Richard for for the conversation about how uh, businesses are are standing up for democracy here in the United States and abroad.